Welcome to UNC Worldview's annual Richardson Lecture. My name, as Gabby mentioned, is Charlotte LaMonica, Director of UNC Worldview. And on behalf of the Worldview Council of Advisors and team, Hazel, Julie, Nick, and Daniel, thank you for joining us for this hour. The Richardson Lecture honors Dick Richardson, former provost of UNC Chapel Hill, who alongside Dr. James Peacock, and Worldview Director Emeritus Robert Fay helped found Worldview in 1998, a public service program which is with the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill dedicated to connecting UNC Chapel Hill global expertise and resources to K-12 educators and community college educators around the state and beyond. A big hello to the Richardson family who I know is out there watching today, and also to the Peacocks and the Fays. For those of you who may not be familiar with us, UNC Worldview offers professional development in global education. We've worked closely with educators from all 100 counties and beyond as they prepare their students with a global mindset. And we could not do it without the generous support of our donors and supporters who will be listed with real gratitude and a thank you email to follow. The Richardson Lecture, honoring Dick Richardson, is an annual community event that celebrates teachers. The program features a renowned speaker who addresses an important global event or topic and champions the value of a teacher providing a global education. We all know, especially right now, teachers that have inspired us and challenged us and propelled us to learn about the world and to help divine one's place in it. During this pandemic, our teachers are really heroes of the time. We all know that. They're working diligently to meet the needs of their students. We're really humbled here at UNC Worldview to work with our partners, many of whom are on this call, and people from around the state and the nation. And we're very fortunate to have Dr. Myron Cohen on campus at UNC as one of the medical leaders in the country fighting COVID-19. There's no doubt, and maybe we'll hear about it, that somewhere in Dr. Cohen's formulative years, there was a teacher noticing his talent and encouraging him to be the best he can be. You'll hear from Dr. Cohen very shortly, but first I'd like to introduce two colleagues and dedicated supporters of UNC Worldview who will briefly set the stage for Dr. Cohen's talk. First, there'll be Dr. Lawrence Rouse, president of Pitt Community College, a longtime partner of UNC Worldview. President Rouse also serves as a member of the Worldview Council of Advisors and will be followed by Ambassador Barbara Stevenson, UNC Vice Provost for Global Affairs and Chief Global Officer. Ambassador Stevenson will then introduce Dr. Cohen. Now please join me in welcoming Dr. Lawrence Rouse, president of Pitt Community College. Thank you, Charlay. I'm honored to give a few brief remarks this afternoon as we prepare for the Richardson Lecture. We are delighted to have speaker Dr. Myron Cohen speak on the very timely subject of fighting infections, the long-term view. And I look forward to his presentation this afternoon. I thank our partners at Worldview for their undying support and partnerships. As president of Pitt Community College, I value our relationship with Charlay LaMonica, Hazel Andrews, and other members of the Worldview team. Pitt Community College is committed to educating and empowering people for success in the global economy. In order to do so, we provide opportunities in co and collaboration with Worldview for our students and staff to be exposed to, interact with, and to learn from diverse multicultural and educational experiences. We're dedicated to bringing the global perspective to our students, to our K-12 partners, our faculty, staff, and the community by creating quality instructional programs that are attractive to both domestic and international students. We also develop international par uh, partnerships that make travel and study abroad possible and by globalizing our curriculum so that all students are challenged to refine their global mindset. 
Pitt Community College is committed to helping students and faculty become more globally competent through education abroad opportunities that extend the borders of the classrooms and create a deeper level of understanding of the subject matter, the world around us, and how the two are interconnected. With the assistance of Worldview, we offer different types of study abroad options that focus on cultural exploration or participating in a service project in their host countries. Each program offers a unique experience for the participants. This past spring, Worldview offered a Global Leaders Travel Abroad program to Ireland, which was an engaging experience for community college presidents and school superintendents. I was fortunate to participate in this innovative program along with many of my colleagues. We came away with a stronger understanding of the global environment in which we lead our institutions. Pitt Community College is approved to educate international students within our social degree programs, and these programs provide students the opportunity to transfer to most four-year colleges and university at the junior level to complete a baccalaureate degree. PCC is fortunate to offer the Scholar of Global Distinctions program as a certificate bearing program which requires students to engage in academic coursework, cultural experiences, travel, and experiences that lead them towards becoming more globally conscious scholars, professionals, and citizens. This certificate is issued by the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and is given upon graduation from Pitt Community College. These are but a few of the global education programs that we offer our students, our staff, and our community partners in collaboration with Worldview and the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. Pitt Community College is a better college because of our affiliation with Worldview. Thank you for allowing me just a few moments to talk about our relationship with Worldview. And at this point, I'm delighted to present to you Ambassador Barbara Stevenson the UNC Vice Provost for Global Affairs and Chief Global Officers. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Ambassador Stevenson. Thank you, Dr. Rouse. I had the chance to visit Pitt Community College last October during the Tar Heel bus tour and to see firsthand the terrific work that you're doing to prepare your students to thrive in a globally connected world. I also had the pleasure of sending you off on the Worldview study trip to Ireland, a place that I called home for three years as an American Consul General in Belfast in my previous life as an American diplomat. I'm grateful to Worldview and to the incomparable Charlay LaMonica for that connection. Through my work with Worldview, I've gotten to see how we're working together locally at the state level and globally to meet the needs of our communities. As a native of Florida with just a year living in North Carolina, let me tell you how impressed I am by the commitment in North Carolina to education, and in particular, global education. I do think it's a big part of the secret of the success of my new home state. UNC Worldview helps develop globally minded educators through transformative professional development opportunities. And through its work with educators, UNC Worldview helps ensure that students are prepared for the future with a global education. Given our theme for this Richardson lecture, which is Teachers as Heroes, Charlay has given me permission to take a moment to pay tribute to a teacher who changed the course of my life, Rosalind Davidson, my high school English teacher. Ms. Davidson taught me to read even the most challenging literature in our language, Paradise Lost, Chaucer, Shakespeare. And she propelled me to a PhD in English at the University of Florida, her alma mater as well. She opened up for me whole new worlds far away from our little town in rural central Florida. And in truth, I, grew, I wanted to grow up and be like her, to be as articulate and fascinating as she was and is. Ms. Davidson also had the great idea for me to start at my local community college while I was still a senior in high school. Once I got that AA, it only made sense for me to go to the University of Florida to complete my degree. I keep that diploma from Lake Sumter Community College on display in my office, as Charlay can attest. 
So I joined Charlay in saluting teachers, the heroes of our time, then and now. And I salute Worldview and Charlay for their inspired work, forging partnerships across the state to bring a worldview into classrooms at all levels. And now it is my honor to introduce our keynote speaker for this year's Richardson Lecture, Dr. Myron Cohen. Dr. Cohen is the Jurgen Bate Professor of Medicine, Microbiology and Immunology and Epidemiology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He serves as the Associate Vice Chancellor for Global Health and Director for the Institute of, for Global Health and Infectious Diseases. Like Provost Richardson, Dr. Cohen is a dedicated public servant who has served the Carolina community for more than 30 years. I actually think for Dr. Cohen, it's getting closer to 40 years now. I would like to highlight Dr. Cohen's seminal work as the architect and principal investigator of the multinational HIV prevention trials network that was recognized in 2011 by Science Magazine as the breakthrough of the year. Dr. Cohen will be the first to say that this achievement was the result of a fundamental model of partnerships. A massive team of researchers working closely with multiple groups of people and communities around the world to achieve a solution, a breakthrough, the breakthrough of the year. Dr. Cohen and his team were instrumental in restricting transmission of HIV AIDS. His contribution to scientific research are of the highest order. I also want to recognize this afternoon his contributions as a teacher and a mentor. Like Provost Richardson, Dr. Cohen has been instrumental in preparing the next generation of global leaders. One of the joys of my job as Vice Provost is to talk to the next generation of researchers who are, they're so impressive and they come in and they, they quote the advice that they got from their mentor, Dr. Cohen, things like, you must always strive to practice at the top of your license. Dr. Cohen's impact across this campus on the next generation of researchers is immense. He works tirelessly behind the scenes to remove obstacles for this next generation of researchers so they can conduct life-saving research. And in the months and weeks past, Dr. Cohen's commitment to public service has been evident as he's worked really around the clock to advise colleagues, researchers, public health experts, and educators around the world. In my mind, Mike Cohen wears a cape. He's a genuine superhero, and it is for me a tremendous honor to work with him and help him remove obstacles and clear paths. In the spirit of Provost Richardson's commitment to public service and his dedication to preparing the next generation of leaders, there's just no one better to honor that legacy than Dr. Mike Cohen. And today, we're grateful to have Dr. Cohen share his perspective at this Worldview Richardson Lecture. Dr. Cohen. Thank you. Now the hardest part of this lecture is getting the slides. Uh, can you see the slides now, Barbara? I can. You can? You can? Is that correct? Yes. Affirmative. Oh, okay, great. I, I've accomplished more than I thought I would. Well, thank you so much for that nice introduction. Um, it's my pleasure to be here and we're going to talk about infectious diseases, which I've worked on for a lifetime, so it's fun to do. <clears throat> I would, I guess, because those before me today have talked about teachers, I would point out like that I actually had a really instrumental teacher as well as so many others. And mine was Mrs. Morris, Roberta Morris. And um, what happened was uh, I was, I would call myself a challenging high school student causing a lot of trouble and maybe getting into trouble. But Mrs. Morris um, saw something in me that maybe I didn't see myself. And she ultimately made me the editor of the school newspaper. I went to a school called Bowen High School. It was the bow and arrow, very clever, B-O-W-E-N, arrow. And by, by um, having that opportunity in high school, I really learned to tell stories in a sense, or to communicate better. Um, and as I went through a career in science and medicine, I think that I've always thought of myself as a better teller of science or a salesman of science than as a scientist. That may be deprecating, but I think Mrs. Morris really uh, helped me to understand the importance of kind of narratives. 
And that kind of leads me into today. I want to talk about infectious diseases. It's a time when our whole lives are incredibly disrupted by infectious diseases. So this ought to be uh, somewhat interesting. So let us begin with this brief talk. So infectious diseases are really common and they're unavoidable because we live in a sea of microbes and they're scary. There are uncountable numbers of movies about infectious diseases. The movie Outbreak with Dustin Hoffman and Rene Rousseau is a great flick uh, in which Dustin Hoffman saved the world. Contagion is a more recent version of the same idea. And then there are countless zombie movies where a virus, instead of killing you, turns you into an undead. Uh, that is very unlikely to happen. But so our, our species has always been concerned about uh, infectious diseases, and new infectious diseases are inevitable, and our responses are often a little bit irrational. For example, at the drugs, one of the best selling airport items is, is a vitamin you take called airborne that is supposed to protect you from getting infected on an airplane. I, I see nothing wrong with this vitamin, but I can absolutely guarantee you taking a vitamin before you get in an airplane is not going to prevent an infectious disease. Another thing is our commitment to toilet seats, which I don't completely understand because in my 40 years of doing this, I've never seen a single patient or heard of a patient who actually got an infection from a toilet seat. But I do understand that there's a kind of a real concern about these. And this idea of covering them with plastics became very popular a few years ago, although I have no idea if, they, if the plastic ever changes. You know, what happens when it goes behind the wall? Does it just endlessly rotate or is there a little guy back there putting new plastic on? But at any rate, these, these kind of things that I see tell me people are really afraid of infectious diseases. So what can we say about infectious diseases? There are three components for the kind of specialists in there, this area. First of all, there's the microbial organisms. And we live in a sea of these organisms. They outnumber humans by orders and orders of magnitudes. They fill every nook and cranny of every space. And the reason we're alive is because we're heavily defended. We're referred to as the host, and we have very great host defenses. And the environment helps to define our risk. And for us, the environment is where you live, what you do, everything about your behavior defines whether a microbe is is going to get cause an infection and sometimes the severity of the infection in terms of human behavior. So how are these microbes transmitted? The thing we fear most and that we're suffering right now are, are bugs that are transmitted human to human. We'll talk about that in more detail in a couple of minutes. Then there's animal to human and this is the problem with petting zoos where this, the, the fur of some of the animals are contaminated with bacteria that can cause very severe diseases especially in children. There's insect to humans, and everyone knows about malaria, and everybody knows about dengue, and, those are, and everybody knows about Lyme disease. So there's a lot of diseases that insects biting us can transmit to us. And lastly, there's the environment, as I've already talked about, um, where you can acquire an infection directly from the environment, either by breathing it or by touching it, et cetera. So the first and most important thing to fight infectious diseases is to understand all infections have rules. It, it doesn't just work that they drop in from outer space. They all have rules. And, and our highest priority for a new infectious disease is to learn the rules. Because once we know the rules, we can do the three things we have to do with the new infection. We have to prevent it, we have to treat it, and we have to cure it. And that's what infectious disease specialists work on from the beginning. Now, the newspapers have come to love a formula that we use routinely that calculates the probability in human to human transmission that the bug will go from one human to another human. And the, the, the number of people that can be infected from one human to another is referred to as the R naught or R sub zero. And bigger numbers are bad because that means a lot of people will get infected and smaller numbers are good. And as we try and deal with prevention of spread, we try and make R0 less than one. We calculate R0 by multiplying three things together. What is the efficiency of transmission of the bug? That's the innate property of the organism to go from one person to another. Also, that depends on the host. So some bugs are very efficient, like diseases like chickenpox 
very readily go from one person to another. Other diseases are much less efficient. Another metric that we multiply is the duration of infectiousness. Infections that kill us really quickly cannot sustain an epidemic. They're terrible, like Ebola, but it's hard for Ebola to sustain a huge epidemic because too many people die of the infection. On the other hand, the reason HIV infection was allowed to, is allowed and has caused such a gigantic epidemic is because once someone becomes infected in the absence of treatment, they remain contagious for the rest of their lives. And the last thing is how many people can be exposed from the infected person. For, for diseases like sexually transmitted disease, you're just exposing one person at a time. For disease like chickenpox or measles that can hang in the air, a single person with chickenpox can infect an entire room of people all at the same time. So the R naught is efficiency times duration times the number of people exposed. And as we're gonna talk about prevention of infectious diseases, we're gonna try and reduce each one of those parameters through different means. So having gotten this far, then we have the new and emerging infections. And there's a lot of them. And I'm not gonna talk about all these different infectious diseases, but they're constant and they're never gonna go away. There's always gonna be new diseases. Um, but the ones I wanna talk about are first HIV, which taught us a lot of lessons starting in 1980. And then I wanna talk about SARS. So 1980 comes along and here's a really great version of me and my wife to the left of me and all my colleagues in China. And talk about global, we were the first Americans to live in China. I had a head of hair that I'm still proud of today and um, learned to speak very bad Chinese during this year in China, where I worked on hemorrhagic fevers. At the same time, when I was leaving China, a new disease surfaced, and that disease was HIV infection. And what I would like to say about HIV infection is that it took us from 1980 to 1984 to even find the virus, and it took us from 1980 to 2000 to understand the rules of the virus. So the technology is so different as you're going to see. It took us 20 years to really understand this virus well compared to our experience with SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 vi uh, virus, which has taken us six months to get a handle on. So for HIV, how is it transmitted? What's the rule of transmission? Most of HIV is sexually transmitted. So it requires volitional behavior to get it. HIV can also be transmitted by blood and blood products, but we very quickly, once we identified the virus, made the blood supply safe, and then transmission was limited to people who inject drugs. And HIV can uh, be transmitted from a mom to her baby, and we call that vertical transmission. And as I've already indicated, HIV, it, HIV let me go back, HIV is not an efficient virus. It takes a lot of exposure for HIV to be transmitted. But because people who are HIV infected untreated remain contagious for the rest of their life, it can sustain a very large epidemic. So recognizing these rules, we need to think about how to prevent this. And we need to figure out how to treat it. And we need to cure it. Well, the treatment part came first. In 1988 and 89, a local company made the first drug called AZT. And now there are 20, 30, 40 drugs that are a once a day pill. And so if you're treated for HIV, you live a normal lifespan. And curing it remains a very high priority because you have to take the pill the rest of your life until we figure out a way to get rid of this, this terrible virus. Preventing this virus, we've tried to make a vaccine unsuccessfully for a variety of reasons, but there have to be other ways to prevent the virus. Behavior change can prevent the, vi the virus. Harm reduction behavior, safer sex, don't use needles, don't inject drugs, so on and so forth. But there was another idea that surfaced shortly after treatment and, Dr. and Ambassador Stevenson got a little bit into this idea. What if, if, if the problem is that people remain contagious for life, what if when we treat them, we render them no longer contagious? And on this slide is this idea that everybody's in a partnership in terms of sexual transmission of HIV. And some people are in partnerships, it turns out, a lot of people are in partnerships where one person's positive and the other person's negative. So what happens if you treat the positive person? Can you reduce the transmission of HIV by treating the positive person? So we did a study that, that uh, Dr. Ambassador Stevenson's alluded to called HBTN052. It took a long time. It took us a lot of years to, 
to do this study. But ultimately we showed that we, we virtually eliminate, eliminate transmission of HIV once we treat somebody. And that became, as was indicated, the science breakthrough of the year. This is my most difficult slide because the then head of the National Academy of Science, Bruce Alberts, made this quote, the results have changed the world, galvanized the world, and I made his mouth move in this slide. So I, I really am very proud of this. It took a lot of work to make the mouth move. At any rate, this was 2011, and this became the standard of prevention for the world, immediate detection and treatment of HIV infection, because the rules demonstrated if you treat people, they're no longer contagious, and they can go about a normal life, normal lifespan, and not infect their partner. So let's move on then from HIV to SARS. And, and we were kind of minding our own business. Coronaviruses are viruses that cause the common cold. And we were minding our own business. And, and this is what a coronavirus looks like. It's, got, it's called a coronavirus because it's got these, this crown on its outer surface. And this crown contains what are called spike proteins and the spike protein at the end of the spike protein in this kind of little space is this is this um, receptor binding domain RBD. Now the coronavirus there there are four different kinds of coronaviruses floating around and before we got into SARS we were all, we were really not even concerned about coronaviruses because they just caused a common cold and so people got a cold their nose was runny, they transmitted it to another person, the next person's nose was runny, no big deal. It was such a not a big deal, we never even tried to develop a treatment for these coronaviruses uh, over many years. Then SARS-CoV-2 came along, SARS-CoV-1, I'm saying SARS virus came along in China, um, and it, it's widely believed that it came from an animal um, to a human, and, and this is a way that we talked about how, how new viruses can get into the species uh, called xenobiotic transmission. So the, this species transmitted this virus uh, to humans and then it spread. Now, and when it spread on the planet, there were 8,400 cases of SARS-CoV-1 uh, SARS and nine or 10% of people died. Um, now, how come this was so self-limited? It's because what happened with this virus is it was only transmitted from symptomatic people. So once we saw this was a problem, and, and most of the people who were symptomatic had uh, elevated body temperature. So for a brief period of time, everywhere in the world, every airport, every, uh, every uh, uh, transport place was taking temperatures. And people with a temperature then were considered potentially SARS carrier. And then eventually this really narrowed itself to, to, to China and to Toronto and a few other places. And there was tremendous transmission at first in hospitals where healthcare workers died because they didn't realize this was there. There was no treatment. It had a high mortality rate, but it wasn't transmitted by asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic people. And this virus just went away. And as it was going away, um, it kind of raised the hackles of fear and along those lines, we see this kind of slide of everyone at that time wearing masks and getting their temperature taken, traveling around in China. And we got these warnings about SARS viruses in 2013. Now on our campus, there's a very dedicated group of SARS, of uh, coronavirus investigators who were working on coronaviruses before there was SARS, led by uh, Dr. Ralph Barrick and his colleague, Dr. Tim Sheehan, and a lot of other people, Dr. Aravinda De Silva. So UNC is a really, really great SARS, uh, uh, coronavirus basic science place. And Dr. Barrick and his friends and colleagues started working on, on treatments and interventions uh, for coronaviruses uh, as SARS came along. There was then a second SARS virus I won't talk about called MERS-SARS. That was limited to the Middle East and that was transmitted from humans to humans from camels. And, every, and there was very little human to human transmission. So a, a human would be hanging around with a camel, the camel would transmit the virus. The death rate for that MERS-SARS is 30%. 
but it never attracted that much attention because it was transmitted so rarely inefficiently from a camel to a human and wasn't spreading for the most part from human to human. So we got away with SARS-1 without much penalty. And we got away with SARS-2, MERS SARS, without much penalty. But then along came SARS-CoV-2. So SARS-CoV-2 taught us the danger of being a homo sapien in this, in this world. Um, and as we best understand it, although we're not entirely sure, again, there was probably an animal to human transmission in Southern China. And then this virus became readily transmissible. It became, it was more efficient and it was transmitted in a different way. It was transmitted as a respiratory secretion, as I'll say in a second, through intimate contact, but about half of all transmission occurs from people who are asymptomatic and remain asymptomatic or are pre-symptomatic. So they're transmitting the disease before they start sneezing and coughing and such. And what happened with SARS-CoV-2 then is it became a worldwide pandemic very, very quickly, spread very, very, this, this became a very efficient bug. And I think this is maybe a week old slide. And what you'll see is at least 26 million people on the planet have been infected, at least 6 million people in the United States, at least, at least 150,000 in North Carolina, with a death rate probably between one and 5%. And the death rate, the morbidity, depends very, very much on comorbidities. Well, what does that mean? It means that the, the, when someone acquires SARS-CoV-2, who's a young, otherwise healthy person, a child or a young adult, they're at risk. There may be progression of disease, but the probability of progression of disease is, is small. But in people in their sixth and seventh decade, 60, 70, 80 years old, people who are, um, have hypertension, people who are, who are obese, the disease seems to run rampant and causes death at a rate of 10, 20, 30%. So we have a vulnerable population. And this is how we understand spread. Most of the spread has to come from what are called droplet nuclei of two people standing close to each other. Um, and that droplet goes from one nose to the other nose. And that's what is sufficient for a spreading event. <clears throat> now, there is some concern, but a small concern, but one that's cost a lot of money, that a contaminated environmental surface could cause disease. You touch the surface, touch your eyes, touch your nose, and you would get SARS-CoV-2. We have very little evidence that that happens. We know surfaces can become contaminated, but the concentration of live replication competent virus is probably very small on a surface. And then another fear that air engineers love to talk about is that the virus might be hanging in the air as measles and chickenpox hang in the air. Most infectious disease experts believe this is not a common form of transmission um, because otherwise the R naught would be much greater. Right now we think one person infects about three people. If this was hanging in the air, one person would likely infect 14 or 15 people. On the other hand, we know that there are super spreading events where people are crowded together and, and under those conditions, one person seems to be capable of infecting a very large number of people at the, same, at the same time. And then as people start leaving that environment, they infect other people, and we end up with hundreds if not thousands of cases. It's estimated that a meeting in Boston at the beginning of the, of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, that one meeting in Boston with a, a couple of hundred people that got infected led to more than 200,000 infections in the United States. So it's, it's a real, real problem. Now, colleges also represent a problem. Well, we're in higher education and, 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 and younger children in school represent a problem. But colleges and younger children, I think that they're, they're especially vulnerable to transmission probability more than they are to becoming sick, at least sick themselves. <clears throat> we, when we start looking in the noses of younger people, these are, would be uh, school children, and young adults like that go to UNC, we, we have some suspicion that the concentration of virus early is um, higher than it is in older adults. So they don't get sick, but they, they have more virus to spread to the next person, we think is a possibility. And oh, symptomatic infection becomes even more rare in school children 
than it is in young adults. <clears throat> and so you have a gradation of symptomatic infection, most likely to occur in older adults, less likely in middle age, least likely in younger people, such as college students and, um, and uh, school age children. And of course, every higher education place in the United States tried to bring their students back, almost all of them did. And to my knowledge, none have really completely succeeded. And that includes UNC. UNC worked so hard, our Chancellor, Dr. Uh, Kevin Guskowitz and our Provost Bob Blue, and they worked tirelessly with a huge team for six months and, and the virus won. I, I think of it as biology meets anthropology. We did everything we could to create a biologically safe space, but anthropology, that is the way, way people interact, the way they mingle, especially after being isolated for long periods of time, anthropology won out and we, we only kept our students in class for a short period of time. Now, the reason we sent students home from, from the campus is not because the classrooms were unsafe. In fact, I will argue to you they were incredibly safe. It's because we didn't want the students to have to be here to go to online classes because we thought the mingling and, and, um, and dorm life would continue to spread the virus. And we were trying to avoid, avoid even a single case of someone with severe disease. One last word about North Carolina. We're, we're kind of publishing our experience next week in uh, morbidity and mortality weekly reports, we had about a thousand young people get infected in a very short period of time. None of them became severely ill. None of them were hospitalized. So in my mind, it was a terrible experience, but the fact that none of them became severely ill than we experienced. Because in fact, when you start looking at the actual statistics of bad illness, you see, uh, you see the causes of death and, and badness uh, in the United States, you see HIV is way up there, 700,000 deaths from HIV before we got good treatment. All of this is before 1996, 98. <clears throat> Spanish flu, almost 700,000 people dead in two years. And COVID now is estimated, uh, COVID-19 is estimated to put at risk, we have about 200,000 deaths so far. We estimate that if nothing changes dramatically in the next three months, We'll end up with at least 400,000 deaths. So it's way up there as a terrible, terrible disease. Okay, so let's get optimistic. Okay, let, let us then point out that here's a virus that surfaces in January. And unlike the 20 years for HIV, in six months, we have a ton of really important things going on. So the probably most important thing I'm going to say in my brief time today is that for all these infectious diseases, there's no magic bullet. We need always a combination of efforts that we think of as combination prevention and combination intervention. So what's the combination prevention for COVID-19? Well, first of all, there's masks. Masks work. Mask, 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 and all the masks work. You can debate that one is claimed to be better on some laboratory test, but wearing a mask if you're infected drastically prevents the probability that you can infect the next person because a cough and a sneeze is in the mask. <clears throat> Wearing a mask if you're uninfected has high grade protection. Now, how do I know that? We've enrolled, we've um, admitted thousands of people with COVID to UNC Hospital. We have no healthcare worker infected. And all we do with healthcare workers is they all wear masks. Now we wash our hands better than the general public, but masks worked in, the, in every hospital in the United States once we saw that masks were required. So masks are the first thing. What's, uh, so it's really, and for an infectious disease rules guy, it's really behavior change. What's the behavior that has to change? So for COVID, it's distance and masks and hand washing. It's very straightforward. It causes massive harm reduction. The second thing is treatment. So we are working very hard with Dr. Barrick's help, our UNC scientist, to identify different drugs that kill COVID in a test tube, kill COVID in a mouse, kill COVID in a monkey, and then should kill COVID in a human. So treatment is really important, and that is earth-shaking, because once you have a treatment and you go to a doctor and they give you a shot or a pill, and you know you're not going to progress, the world will have changed. Now, treatment can also serve as prevention. We're working very hard to see whether treatment on the day we start the treatment and the next day stops the virus from replicating in your nose, because if, we, if treatment is prevention, it's earth-shaking. And then the last thing we are working on, but what gets the greatest amount of publicity are vaccines. There are many, many vaccines in clinical trials. Vaccines have worked in mice and monkeys successfully 
and now they're in humans. And we anticipate that we'll have many vaccines in the spring of this year. Which is gonna be the best vaccine? How long will the vaccine work? How effective will it be? Will there be any, any, any anticipated side effects? We don't know that yet. But we know that six months ago, the virus didn't exist. And in six months, we made a lot of vaccines. <clears throat> we also can give the same treatment drug. The treatment drugs can also be used for prevention. Some of the treatment drugs are called monoclonal antibodies. Vaccines force the uh, generation of an immune response that makes antibodies. So we know what antibodies are needed. We can make the antibodies in a test tube, and instead of waiting for a vaccine to work, we can infuse the antibody and give you immediate protection. So here's the vaccines. There's three platforms to the vaccine that you've heard about already. There's the old tried and true vaccine. That's called a protein plus adjuvant vaccine. There's an adenoviral vector vaccine, or a measles, uh, a VZV, varicella vector vaccine. That's where we put the, the, the piece of machine that'll make the, uh, the, the appropriate protein in a viral vector. The virus doesn't hurt you, but it helps you to make uh, an antibody response. And then there's this brand new idea, which is the first vaccines will be out there by Pfizer and Moderna of messenger RNA that sends in a, a hunk of, of RNA message in a, in, a, in a particle essentially, and the host makes antibodies. So all of these things are gonna make antibodies. Now, the other idea I've already told you about is why don't we just make the antibodies in a test tube and give them to you? Lily, Regeneron, AstraZeneca, BMS, they're all making either single antibodies or cocktail of antibodies to give you. And these antibodies can be used for prevention as passive immunity, or they can be used for treatment. For, we're very involved in, the, in both in the monoclonal antibody part of it. And, and you can see they offer immediate protection. They can be given to people who can't make a good response to a vaccine, people who might be living in nursing homes, and they might block viral replication in somebody infected and, and block progression of disease. Our targets for monoclonal for prevention are nursing home residents, and we're doing this already with Lilly, high incidence workplaces like meatpacking plants, we're probably gonna do that, and index cases, that's somebody living in a household. You have COVID, you go home, there's about a 10% chance or higher that your relative's gonna get COVID, we can go to the household and also give an antibody that gives immediate protection, we hope, against COVID uh, acquisition. And we're doing such experiments with the Regeneron antibodies. So the Lilly antibodies and the Regeneron antibodies, they've left the train station. The Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer mRNA vaccine and the uh, AstraZeneca adenoviral vector, all those have left the train station. They're all in progress. And this, again, I'll emphasize is six months after this thing was discovered. So nursing homes are a really, really big deal. So I told you that 200,000 Americans have died, at least 35, probably closer to 40% are living in skilled nursing facilities. Um, and um, among the, those not living in skilled nursing facilities, a lot of the deaths are in people with comorbidities, but not all the deaths are, are there. There's 100 children who've died. There's some young people who died. There's a lot of 50 year olds who died. So it's Russian roulette. We can't tell you when you get COVID, but that you're gonna be the one to suffer terrible disease progression. This is what Lily is doing. Um, they're going uh, with vans to the nursing homes. It's kind of a turnkey operation of randomizing both the people working in a nursing home, as well as the uh, clients in the nursing home to be randomized to a placebo or a, um, a monoclonal antibody called LY. Um, now, there is another idea, and that's alternative treatment. So we talked about prevention, and there's alternative treatments. And the treatments are being run out of Operation Warp Speed, and there's four kinds of treatment. One kind of treatment is anti-inflammatory agents, and you've heard about this, that this cytokine storm idea, and that the drug dexamethasone serves as an anti-inflammatory that reduces death. Another thing is to give an outpatient a drug, and I'm gonna come back to that. A third thing that he gives an inpatient a drug, and I'm gonna come back to that a little bit. And the fourth thing is blood clots are bad in people with COVID, and so you can stop blood clotting with anticoagulation. And these four things are all ways to make people with COVID survive. Now, the big breakthrough of the week this week is as follows. The same antibody that Lily is using in these nursing homes, the LY antibody that comes in a van, that same antibody is being used for outpatient treatment and inpatient treatment. 
This week, Lilly announced that in their outpatient study that enrolled 400 patients, they gave three different doses of this antibody to people that were well. They're, they're outpatients, they're, they have symptoms, but they're not that sick. They reduced people going on to require going to the hospital just with this one antibody, one time, by 72%. This is a small study, but this is a really big deal. This is the beginning of treatment that stops progression of disease, and in data they haven't presented yet, they also show that the same treatment can reduce viral replication, so treatment likely will serve as progression. Lilly is doing a bigger study now, Regeneron's doing a bigger study, all the companies are also doing bigger studies of these kind of drugs um, in order to change the world. So let me end with 15 minutes for questions. Here's the bottom line, and I, I apologize, I talk very fast, a lot of information, but I hope it's interesting. Humans are not going to escape infectious diseases. We are going to suffer from infectious diseases, some of which are going to go from human to human and therefore be called contagious. The most important thing we do in my field is learn the rules, because once we know the rules, we have a plan. The rules determine how the agents spread. The rules determine how sick you get from the infection. The rules determine how we prevent infection and how we treat infection. And you see that from what I've talked about HIV and COVID. Our current technology allows us remarkable responses to infections. We learn about the infection in January. We're in the clinic with drugs six months later. It's truly remarkable. We've developed prevention strategies that include mass, mass, masks, vaccinations, passive immunity with monoclonal antibodies, and treatment as prevention. And we've developed treatments right now with monoclonal antibodies and a couple of antiviral drugs. The drug remdesivir is under emergency authorization. We're testing another drug here on this campus. But all of this, the new normal is all about combination prevention. This just doesn't go away overnight. We need to be thinking creatively about combination prevention to create a new normal that is much more tolerable than our current normal. Let me then thank you for inviting me. I knew Provost Richardson, and I certainly know Jim Peacock and his wife well. Uh, I, I'm a great admirer of all that they've done for the university and for education. Um, let me thank all the, all the people I've worked with who developed and participated in the studies that I've done, including ongoing studies right now with COVID. Uh, those who helped me with this talk. I hate making slides, so I had to steal everybody else's slides in order to give a talk. And to all the people who funded all the work I've done, which is listed on the bottom of this slide, most recently were heavily funded for the COVID Prevention Network by the National Institute of Health. So I am gonna stop. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope it was not that boring. Thanks. Mike, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cohen. I thought that was absolutely fascinating, and I'm sure others did as well. We've got more questions than we'll have time to answer, and one of them I'm going to get you to do is to repeat the three steps that um, everyone should take immediately to control the pandemic. Yeah, I, I think and this is not not rocket science. I, I, it could be rocket science because I wrote an article about it in January that, that I showed the slide of, but it's, you know, we now know mass, mass work, but most important is that your neighbor is wearing a mask. We do not have a culture. If you go to China and you're not wearing a mask, you get beaten with a stick, okay? The people will run up to you and say, where's your mask? We're very uncomfortable having people pull a mask up over their nose or saying, why are you not wearing a mask? It's not our culture. But, and that's, that is a heartbreaking cultural problem because we have so much COVID. So masks work. Then beyond that, it cannot be bad. Right, it can't be bad. I know you wear your mask when you're, you don't need to wear it right now. Thank you, but, but I appreciate the, the, the show and tell. Don't leave um, the office without it. <laughs> masks work. Our last conversation. It, can't, it can't be bad to wash your hands. And when you're in a situation without a mask, it can't be bad to keep six, eight feet away from the next person because we see no reason to believe that this virus can be transmitted over great distances. So, but I think with a mask on, I mean, Bob Redfield, head of the CDC yesterday, I think he's right. He, he kind of was getting at masks are the condoms of the COVID generation, right? We, we knew that condoms work for sexually transmitted disease. We know that masks work for COVID. And Dr. Redfield said, if a vaccine's made available, he sees a mask as 
uh, as just as important as a vaccine. Not to undermine a vaccine. So the, enough said. I hope that those are the three things, distance, masks, and hand hygiene. So Mike, I'm gonna take you in a direction you don't expect with a question that has just come in in the chat. And it is a, a counterfactual. What do you think the death toll would be today from COVID-19 if it happened back when we didn't have the technology, the tracking, and the communication of today? Well, right now, it would look like the Spanish flu. There would be, there would be, I think at least 50 million people with COVID. We have six million. I'd multiply everything by tenfold. There'd be 50 million people with COVID. Easy, um, no, no question. I think 50 million would be an underestimate, and I think our death rate would be we'd have millions dead, because even imperfect as we are across all of the world, not just the United States, even as imperfect as we are, we're doing a lot of stuff to reduce COVID transmission. Uh, with behavior change, imperfect behavior change. So I would, I would think this thing would have killed millions of people by now uh, in the United States alone. And of those interventions that kept it from being 50 million, can you single out the ones that you think probably had the biggest impact? Uh, I think unequivocally, the kind of lockdowns, number one, we have 14,000 nursing homes with a million people in nursing homes. I think, now you, you need to kind of look at this as I look, let's go to HIV for a second. UNC in 1984 was managing 5,000 people with hemophilia. They moved here to get blood products. By 1984, 20% of all the admissions to UNC hospital were for AIDS coming from hemophilia through no people getting contaminated blood supply. We lost 80% of all the hemophilia on the planet in, in, in two or three years. So, so how, it, the disease surfaced in 80 and 84, we had lost all those people with hemophilia. We couldn't stop it, right? So the technology was so unprepared to recognize the rules and stop this, you know? Um, so I think the technology now has allowed us this kind of massive intervention. Getting to nursing homes, what happened? We saw, wait, these deaths are coming from nursing homes, no visitors, no travel, employees screened. So, and there's still a big problem in nursing homes, but it would be out of control. The, the nursing homes, the, the skilled nursing facilities would look like hemophilia in 1980, if you follow. In other words, we would have saved no one in a nursing home without our technology. We would never have figured this out. So you've looked back, look forward for us, Mike. What, what will it look like, let's say, a year from now? And we can do this broadly with society, but given our audience with teachers, how about thinking about kind of K through 12 as well? Well, that's a really great question. And obviously, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, we're going to have vaccines. And we, we're going to have to see how effective they are and whether there's any safety signals. You, you can't give an otherwise healthy person a vaccine that has any substantial danger. Okay, so, so, and we've created a pretty big mess politicizing vaccines. We just need to see how well they work. This idea, I mean, by the way, the idea that we're gonna have a vaccine on a certain date, I don't know, it's impossible. We, we've got to see the endpoints and we don't know how many endpoints we, you know, will be in either arm. We don't know that they work. They work in monkeys, great. So why, why are we so optimistic? Because there's no monkey that, and, but monkeys don't die of SARS-CoV-2. When we give a monkey a vaccine, we prevent them from, growing much virus in their nose, but they don't get pneumonia under normal circumstances. So we need to see what happens with humans and not monkeys. Now, so we're gonna have, a, we're gonna have vaccines and those vaccines are gonna contribute, but they're not gonna make masks go away, okay? There's gonna need to be change in behavior on top of vaccines, that's the first point. The vaccines are not gonna go, they're almost certainly gonna go to higher risk people and that won't be college students or children. And children aren't even being tested for vaccines right now. One of the great fights is when do we get to give these vaccines to children? That fight is not resolved. The, the pharmaceutical industry is very afraid to give a young child a vaccine until they're, they're really sure it's very, very safe. And I, I understand that. So we're gonna have vaccines. We're gonna have masks for sure. Um, and then I believe that we'll have treatments that make people incredibly less afraid. That'll happen is like, and I'll speak for myself, you know, like, so, okay, 
I'm going to get SARS-CoV-2, but I know that if I start sniffling or sneezing, I can get a test that's very sensitive, and I know I can get a shot, and that shot is going to stop me from progressing. As an old and a fat person, I'm like a poster person. I'm a poster person for progression of disease. So I think these treatments, and, and really the, this Lilly announcement yesterday, which is in the New York Times and all over the place, that announcement is a big deal. It's a little study, but it's the, the gate is open. It's the first step. This is the same as for HIV in 1988, there was no treatment. Everybody died. In 1989, we had a drug called AZT. That was like earth shaking because all of a sudden people weren't dying at the same rate. So I'm, I'm quite optimistic. I'm not pessimistic. I know next year will be different. That is a marvelous, um, that's a marvelous note almost to end on. And I think I'm actually going to do that rather than ask you one more question, because that was just, there's been so few talks on the pandemic that have ended there, Mike, and that was a brilliant way to bring it home and give us, and give us some hope for the future. Um, I want to thank you for a, a brilliant lecture. It's, it was so clear. It was riveting. And, um, I know that uh, Provost Richardson would be so proud that you gave the lecture today. So thank you, Mike. Thank and you. now I'm going to turn this back to UNC Worldview Director, Charlay LaMonica to close. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Dr. Cohen, for sharing those stories of science. I bet you'd get an A plus from Roberta Morris. But we're really glad that you went into the field of science. So thank you for sharing your expertise and your insight with us. I'm most appreciative of the time you took out of your schedule. And also many thanks to President Rouse and Dr. Stevenson for their time to be part of this program. But most of all, I really want to thank our educators that have attended today, our partners all around the state, our supporters, for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate your interest in attending the Richardson Lecture and look forward to working with you hand in hand in the days ahead. Our future programs, after we talk to our partners in terms of what types of things they would be interested in, really now uh, we are moving forward in the fall virtually with global perspective shared narratives for K-12 in terms of a series offered this fall and a program for community college educators entitled Global Health, The Changing Prognosis, which will be offered in November. And if you'd like to have more information, you can check our website. And as a last comment, and very brief, and in the spirit of the way Provost Richardson makes a difference in the world, we want to think about a teacher who's making a difference in a student's life. We wanna let them know, and we wanna appreciate them because I think we can all agree that teachers really are the heroes of our time. So thank you so very much for attending the Richardson Lecture. Many thanks, stay safe, and goodbye for now. Thank you.